scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 8. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the oak at Moreh and at that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. Thank you, Bob. Familiar texts. You know, we know that one. <clears throat> and we've been doing that for the past few weeks, just connecting with revisiting these texts that we oftentimes know. We've been revisiting Bible stories, uh, familiar ones, where people encounter God in locations that perhaps we might find ourselves during summer break. And this is kind of the, this is the, the last mile of summer break, sorry, young people, to, to <laughs> acknowledge that. But, you know, it's, it's August, you know, it's late summer now. And uh, so maybe you've done some of these things that we've revisited and we've, we've visited over, over the course of the summer. During our summer break, uh, we've learned uh, lessons and we've we read stories uh, from the Bible of people that encounter God on mountains maybe this summer we you've gone and visit one of the mountains uh, along lakes perhaps you have gone to a lake this summer and we've encountered stories where people encounter the divine along lakes we just went to a lake yesterday and we have quite a story about that if you want to ask one of the condos um, it does involve uh, dogs on top of paddle boards that may or may not have gone so well. Upon mountains, upon, along lakes, over oceans. Maybe you went to the coast and visited the ocean this summer. And finally, uh, for today's text, during road trips. Summer is road trip season, is it not? Where it's usually a time where you make a journey, you go somewhere. Maybe it's a long journey, maybe it's a shorter one, but it's still road trip worthy. You know, time to go on a, on a road trip. Grab some Nature Valley granola bars, some Gatorade, and it's time to go on a road trip. Well, over the next few weeks here, we're going to be considering how the road, or going on trips, or going on journeys, uh, can that can be taken and understood literally and metaphorically for our lives if you're not the traveling type well understand the road or the road trip as a journey of your life in itself how these challenge and shape us in new and often unexpected ways taking a trip going on a journey you always come back a little bit different something has changed your world has expanded just a little bit when you go on the road there's something to be said about how a person or a group can, out, can undergo deep, formative work while they travel somewhere. There's something to be said about that. To go on the road is often synonymous with change. I'm going to go on the road. 
Now, the summons of Abram that we just heard there in Genesis chapter 12 sounds an awful, like, an awful lot like being sent out on a road trip, does it not? Abram is given a divine green light to go. Go from their home country. Go from what's all familiar. Go from your family. Go on a road trip. To go from all that they hold dear and to, to go from all that they are familiar with. And while this journey of Abram and Sarai was highlighted with spiritual overtones of both personal covenant and promise, as we read there in verses 3, we can just as readily understand the story as a parable for our own faith journey as it is understood in our own lives. Whenever we read about Abraham and whenever we read about these two, we, we can read this as, well, they're going on a journey just kind of like how I am on a, on a journey as well in, faith, in my life and in my faith. Often and without prediction, Changes in life become the roads of transformation in our lives, can they not? We encounter changes in our lives. We weren't expecting. It just happened. It's there. It wasn't there, and now it is. Changes happen in our lives. Changes in, of, that happen in our lives that they become roads of transformation. You don't stay the same when change comes around in your life. They become uh, roads of perspective. They become roads of opportunities for spiritual growth when change happens. Have you ever found yourself being sent into some unknown land, so to speak, where the life you once knew was now suddenly a memory of your past? Have you ever encountered that? Where you realize, my life is no longer going to be the same. That part of my life is now my past. I can't go back. My life has changed. I'm, I'm sensing, and I'm and I, you know, reading into the text, that's probably a lot like what Sarah and Abram were feeling. Perhaps Haran was now a memory. That was a place where mom and dad were, and now they are going on to a new area, into a new place. Some of these changes we choose that occur into our life, we choose them. We choose and they are of our own doing. Uh, other changes have been given to us. They're a matter of our, you know, kind of our responsibility. They're in the, the realm of responsibility. And still other changes have been thrust upon us. We didn't ask for that change. We didn't ask for this to be given to us, and yet that's how life is now. Change has happened because it's been given to us and thrust upon us because normally we wouldn't have wanted to pick it up. And yet it still happened. A part of life is the certainty that the scenery of our lives will most certainly change. We can't help but the scenery in our life changing. It just happens. It's a part of living. It's a part of being human. And how do we do so then? This is the question. How do we do this change, whether it's chosen, whether it's given, or whether it's thrust upon us, how do we do this with God alongside of us? That's the good question to ask. These changes are the contexts we find ripe and in league with the redeeming God of our lives. In all things, we are told to rejoice because in all things, there is the possibility to bring shape, a transcendent, a transcendent purpose and hope, and even life to those who, journey, who desire to journey with the mystery of God. There is an opportunity at hand whenever there is change. There's always an opportunity at hand, whether we plan the change or not, there is something to be learned from. There is an opportunity for growth and transformation now to happen with us, within us. The thing about it is, you know, we always think, well, because it's an opportunity for spiritual growth or because it's an change has happened that we 
in order to make it spiritual, somehow we have to be happy about it. Let me just say you don't have to be happy about the change. You are released from that from here on out. You don't have to be happy about it. You can complain about the change. You can gripe about it. You can lament and mourn the change. It, that's okay. That doesn't mean that God is not going to be with you. The point is, is to always be seeking God in the midst of that. In the midst of these unexpected life events. These journeys, these quote-unquote road trips. It's okay. If it sits and settles in, into a part of your life that makes you uncomfortable, that's okay. Continue to seek God within it. Continue to seek spirit within this time. Remember how Jesus gave Nicodemus a heads up about how this nature of such a life of journeying with God. In John chapter 3, John uh, Christ told uh, Nicodemus these words about those who seek to journey with God in the midst and in the season of all, the, all of the areas of their life. Jesus says this, this is what people who do that are like. He says, the wind blows where it chooses, Nicodemus. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, those who are guided by the Spirit might appear much like how Abram and Sarai appeared in this story. They were sent away, moving forward, not just content to settle down, but to move into, in search of a place where, that God desires for them. To be driven by the Spirit, to be sent by the Spirit, and to be in league with the Holy One. There is a life where we choose that, where we seek God in the midst of all of our changes. If that's the case, and that's the opportunity, this is simply a knock on the door. That, you know, it's up to us to, to let it in, to, to live into it. Therefore, opposite, considering Abram and Sarah's journey, opposite how Dorothy clicked her red ruby heels, were they slippers? Or were they shoes? I, did, I was writing that. Were they red ruby slippers? Shoes. <laughs> I kept like erasing shoes and slippers when I was writing this. Opposite how Dorothy clicked her red ruby heeled shoes to get back to her home in Kansas. Remember her mantra? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. That's what she was supposed to say to get there. The first ta opposite of her, the first task of Abram and Sarah was to be sent away from all that's familiar. They weren't supposed to go back home. They were supposed to go someplace else. Where are you going, Abram and Sarah? We don't know. Why are you going? Well, the God we serve told us to go. So what's the plan? We don't know. Remember what Jesus said, it's like those that are driven by the Spirit will be like that. You don't know where it's coming or where it's going, so it is those who are born of the Spirit of God. Sent by cooperation and choice, this was not, they were not forced to do this, they chose this. Sent by cooperation and choice into the great unknown by an even greater unknown. That's what makes Abram and Sarai such powerful prophets. These are prophets. God is speaking directly to them. It doesn't say that Abram was reading his Bible one day and this happened. It just said God spoke to him, unmediated. It just happened. It sounds a lot like Quakerism. Abram being spoken, Abram and Sarah being spoken to by God. They were powerful prophets, and the proof of that power was in their actions. They were willing to do it. They weren't willing to just talk about it, you know. They weren't willing to just kind of take on the label as their new identity. They were willing to do something about it. They were willing to go. They know what it's like to look for a place called to call home. 
That's what I like and appreciate about them. A place God said that would be revealed to them. And we should take note how this theme of home seeking, always looking for home, always looking for a place to settle down. This home seeking becomes a prevalent theme throughout the rest of the book of Genesis. You ever notice that, that the main, the main characters in Genesis are, are always, they're always looking for a home? Or they thought they had a home and then they were removed, and so they're looking for family, they're looking for home. I'm thinking of, of uh, Joseph. I'm thinking of then the people of Israel there in the book of Exodus. That theme keeps rising up, and it's almost like these first two set the theme for the rest of the Pentateuch, and even it even bleeds into the rest of the Old Testament scriptures. How Israel is always looking for a home, this home-seeking, almost as if there is an eight sense to find that garden mentioned back in Genesis 1. What home are they looking for? Well, 11 chapters ago, if you would open to Genesis 1, there was a garden at one time that the human family found themselves in. And then what happened? We were sent out east, east of Eden. It's interesting how the direct, just directionally, and I'm reading into this, directionally, Haran, to get down to Canaan, is west. <laughs> It's the opposite direction of having been exiled out of Eden. It's almost as if the, the, that history itself is the human family being sent on a journey to recapture and regain the Garden of Eden again. That's what we're looking for. To this point, the gospel writers record how it's no accident that the discovery of Christ's resurrection happens within where? Where was Christ resurrected? In a garden. <laughs> That's intentional. The gospel writers are saying, you know, this place that Abram started with Abram and Sarah and the people of Israel, they've always been looking for the garden. Where's the garden? And whenever we look at the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of uh, the resurrection and the resurrection happens then again at a garden. And then we find the early followers of Jesus going to the garden to encounter this resurrected Christ. There is a completed work found in the raised Jesus that we are all invited to seek and find. The gospel is saying the gateway back to the garden is Christ. You can find it again. And again, it's layered in metaphor. It's layered in that. The poet Rumi once wrote, and maybe you saw, I, I put it out on our sign one time. Rumi once wrote this, as you start to walk on the way, the way appears. As you start to walk on the way, the way appears. Here in this simple sentence, I believe, is the heart of simple faith. To move forward in life without, without having all of the answers. To move forward anyway. But trusting that illumination and understanding will come in time as long as we keep moving. To move forward. To move forward in hope. To, go, to move forward in faith and trust. That within the context of going on a journey, here is another paradox in the Christian way of life. A part of us becomes found when we move away from all that's familiar. That's an interesting par paradox about Christianity. Jesus, time and time again, says to the people that are listening to him and kind of leading in from the crowds, what's he saying? He says time and time again, if you seek to find your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. There's this beautiful kind of interrelationship that, with paradox when you start to follow Jesus in your life and in your actions, not just in your mouth, but in your heart and in your actions. You find something 
that you didn't expect to find when you start to lose yourself for the sake of the gospel. So what is found? What is found in this paradox? How about some of these? As we go and we begin to walk in the way and as the way appears, what is found? A life of hope, a life of simple trust. It's not complicated. Simple trust. A childlike faith is found when you begin to walk in the way and you take those, those trust steps into the, into the Christ life. A childlike faith. Here's a big one. Humility. Humility is found as we begin to walk in the way. Here's another big one. Patience. You have to be patient. How do we access patience? How do we access humility? These words that everyone would say, oh yes, those are good. How do you get there? I don't know. Trying hard? Yeah. <laughs> We've all tried it, haven't we? The willingness and readiness to offer grace to others is found. When you begin to journey, when you begin to road trip alongside and with God, embracing God in the midst of life's changes. In our Quaker settings, we often talk about such words, simple trust, childlike faith, humility, patience, but we don't always know how to access them. We don't always know how to access that. In the story of Abram and Sarai, they are, they are accessible uh, to us as they are sent. as they are willing to go and try something new. That's the story, that's the heart of the story of Abram and Sarah. They're going, and, going into the great unknown and trying something new for the sake of the call of God. Maybe in the story of Abram and Sarai, we can draw confidence, we can draw trust, and even instruction during our own times of cultural and institutional changes and transformation. It's almost as if the answers have always been there, just right under our nose. We know these stories. The answers are always there, but we need to see them kind of in a new way as we journey within our own life and as we journey in the present times and challenges that we face. And we may inwardly, inwardly ask ourselves, what is all this change for then? Why do, we, why do we have to go through all of this? Why is this even necessary? Can't we just, you know, isn't life just about settling down and ending well in, peace, in a peaceful garden, so to speak? Why all this change? Why all this journey? I, was, I, I assume that, you know, uh, Ab Abram's age was put in there for a reason. He was 75. He was probably looking forward to retirement, <laughs> ending well and just settling down in Haran. And then comes the voice of God that says, leave this place and all that's familiar. Why? For what purpose? Well, whenever you read the, those, those verses in the scripture, remember that the faith and migration of Abraham and Sarah, which they would eventually, their names would become, Abraham and Sarah, it went beyond them. What they were doing went beyond them. <clears throat> Even the text says it was more about the lives of generations to come than it was for them. And so it is with us. We change and we are willing to journey, not for the sake, not for our own sake, but for the sake of those to come after us. That's why you do it. Ultimately, that's the, the bigger picture. That's why you change. It's for those that you don't see yet. It's for those that you have hope for. It's for those that have yet to come. That's why you journey with hope. That's why you change with God. And that's why you embrace this way that is demonstrated by Abram and Sarah. 
in this short story and text. So maybe we can see ourselves in this somewhere. There's some journey, there's some change, there's something new that you've encountered in life. How then, the question is, how then can I encounter this, even if it's uncomfortable or comfortable, how can I encounter this by including God within it and seeing God within it? Seeing the holy, where once we just thought perhaps maybe it's an inconvenience or it's just something I have to put up with. No, how do we see the holy within these things, within your life? I th I, I, I'm sincere when I say, I think whenever we simply, in a childlike way, ask and beseech heaven for eyes to see, we, we will be given eyes to see. We will be given ears to hear when we ask for it. We don't just let it sit and settle as a desire. Boy, I wish if, fill in the sentence. But we act and we seek and ask for eyes to see and ears to hear. That's what it is to, to embody this. To validate belief in action, not just in thought, but in action. That's what I love about this story. It's about going and doing something and having a goal moving forward. I have some queries for open worship. I would like to speak to the meeting before we go into a time of open worship. Uh, I wish I used a different colored font. Sorry about that. I'll just, I'll just ask it here. How does this text speak to your condition today? If you want to revisit that text. How does this text speak to your condition? How might this story change, the story of change, faith, journey, and promise encourage you and keep you? How's it, how does it speak, but how does it encourage you to live a little different, to see things a little different? How has your faith been shaped, in, by, your li <clears throat> shaped by your own life's journeys? You ever wonder, you know, kind of, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I end up here? Oh, thank you. It's oftentimes it's in these journeys that we take. Sometimes those journeys are relationships. Sometimes those journeys are seasons of pain. Sometimes those journeys are seasons of joy. But it's good to look back and recount how we've arrived at where we are in life. Friends, let's center down, center down and uh, allow the teacher that is within us all to speak to our condition. If you feel so moved to share in a time, this time of open worship, Carol has a microphone. If anyone online, if you feel so moved to share in vocal ministry during open worship and you're prompted by spirit, uh, make sure that you're unmuted so that we can hear you. Let's center down, friends. Almost in an in a agricultural type way, a seed has been planted, and now it's okay to cover it over now. <laughs> you know, bury it within and let it grow and let it continue to speak and let it continue to commune um, so just because we've kind of concluded a time of, of uh, corporate sharing doesn't mean the word uh, ceases to uh, affect change and to speak to our condition. So as the spirit leads and as the seed speaks uh, within, I, I pray that that is something that continues uh, on into the week 
And I was just reminded of that, uh, Elizabeth, when you mentioned Gil, uh, Gil George's uh, sermon last week. I've been, that, is, that too has been speaking to me and has, uh, I have found application uh, to that message all of last week and into even my writing <laughs> this week. We do want to uh, have a time to mention any, uh, uh, any concerns or joys that we want to uh, bring to the, uh, the attention of the meeting for the sake of prayer. Uh, Paul, welcome home, and so good to have you back. I'm glad that you're, you're home safe with family, and uh, we just embrace you. And Tricia, Mike, so, so good to see you here and a welcome on site. It's so good to have you. Anything else in particular that we want to we want to mention? I have a prayer request, but I want to proceed it by addressing a, que a question that you asked, Mark. So with God, how do we go on this journey? Hmm. And the question that's been in my mind for some time is how in the world do people without God go on this journey being lost and not knowing the rest of the rest of the way so the prayer request is this most of you know that my sister died on the 20th of last month and just this week her oldest daughter sue at age 59 passed away she had been having health issues for many years but it was still a shock to the family so the prayer request is this for her, sis, her sister and brother, my nephew and niece, Sharice uh, and Scott, and their families, if you could keep them in prayer, because uh, frankly, they're trying to go it alone. God is not part of their life. Mm -hmm. And so if you can keep Sharice and Scott in your prayers this week, I think that would be a great thing. Thank you. I know very often um, you know the mystery God holds us in times of knowing and unknowing and uh, it is our prayer for Sharice and Scott as they process um, the loss of these family members and hold them in light. Let's pray. Creator, we encounter you in the silence and in the stillness of our heart. And Lord, we acknowledge that we are we are known. We are known before you. And we thank you that because we are known, we are held. And when we, in our own times and when we are ready, because we are held, Lord, we read a story about how we are sent. We ask, O oh God, for wisdom, and we ask for your spirit and your light to hold us in these times. We are grateful for when family and friends can come near and we can visit. We are mindful, Lord, this morning of Dana and Nancy and Sharice and Scott. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would hold them near to your heart and that your peace that transcends our intellect and understanding would 
speak words of consolation, speak words of life, speak words of your peace that only you can give. We hold these dear friends up to you and trust you with them. And Lord, as we have been uh, sharing today and as we have been moved of spirit, may that work continue to take root uh, in us as we remember the ways in which we have lived, as we remember the ways in which we have encountered the holy, and as we remember how the life of Christ speaks a true word to our condition, O oh God. May we carry that with us from this space and this place. For it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Really just one announcement here uh, this morning, uh, y'all. Uh, we have Bible study this Tuesday uh, at 10 a.m., both on-site and online. <clears throat> and just wanted to invite, uh, invite anyone out to that. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark and having some co uh, lively conversation uh, around, around the good questions that come up uh, around that text. So uh, invitations to that. Uh, otherwise, with that, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to hand, I'm going to give Bob a, a, a minute <laughs> as he gets to his computer uh, because he's our facilitator. But on that note, we're going to go ahead and dismiss. And may we go in peace and uh, feel free to partake of the donuts and goodies out there in the foyer and mingle a little bit. Uh, Bob, thank you. Uh, we see you. Friends online, good to see all of you. Brian, up in Alaska, I hope Alaska is treating you well. And uh, we see many other friends uh, there online. Good to see all of you. Hi, Doug. Good to see you. All right. Friends, may you go in peace. Good to see y'all. <laughs>